Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, good to be with you. Let's pray and uh, spend a little bit of time just uh, preparing our hearts through worship. And uh, Jeremy will uh, have a song for us, and then we're going to get into the Word this morning. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us. We pray, Lord, that as we spend some time in your presence this morning, that you would join us and come close to us. And God, that your revelation would just come to our minds and our heart and our spirit would connect with you. Lord, that we would be more like you in the uh, sense that, in, and in the ways that you've called us and, and you want us to be. God, I ask that you would reveal your will for us and um, allow our relationship with you to deepen today as we spend time in your word getting to know you. And um, we're grateful that you've prepared a way and opened up this opportunity for us. So Holy Spirit, come and have your way. Begin to do a work in us and around us and in our homes. And uh, we just love you so much and declare our gratitude and our love for you today through this time of worship. Be with us now as we spend time in your presence. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's worship. We'll come right back. Uh, get into the word, continuing kind of where we left off last week. Lord, you're glorious and you're marvelous and you're worthy of our praise. We worship you this morning and we lift you up.
Well, God, we're grateful that we can worship you, that we can spend time in your presence and that you join us and that you always show up, that you never leave us or forsake us, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, God, as we come to you today, we know that you are good and faithful, kind and true, loving and um, strong and powerful, and uh, Lord, that you have our best interest in mind. And um, as we spend time now just understanding uh, how we can be more like you, that we can um, practically live day in and day out uh, the way that you've called us to be and, and want us to be. Um, Lord, I ask that it would come to mind as we hear these truths of your scripture, uh, simple and practical ways that we can live this out. We love you today in Jesus' name. Be with us, change us, mold us into the image that you've created us to be and help us to continually become more and more mature. Uh, as your kingdom citizens, as your children. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Good to be with you. Uh, turn in your Bibles with me, if you would, to um, Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. We're going to start at verse 33. But before we do, let's kind of recap a little bit where we left off last week. So last week, we ask this question, does it matter what we do? I'm just going to jump right in this morning. Uh, does it matter what we do um, in regards to sin? Does it matter what we do in regards to just our daily activities? We talked about how God calls us his masterpiece, and he says we're his masterpiece for something specific. What does he say? We're his masterpiece uh, for good deeds so that we can do good things. Uh, last week, we went through uh, some of those things, right? But we asked ourselves, does it matter what we do in regards to sin, especially if Jesus now, um, his blood has cleansed us of our sins. So when we ask forgiveness, uh, he's faithful to forgive us. Um, and we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is God's son, our Lord and Savior, that he died and he rose again and paid for the uh, penalty of our sins. And we have received forgiveness through that. So does it matter then after that, if that's the qualification, if we sin? Well, Hebrews 10, 26, as we looked at, says that it does. It says if we deliberately go on sinning after the uh, knowledge of truth, then there no longer remains a sacrifice. So if we deliberately, knowing that what we're doing requires the sacrifice in order to make us right with God, Another part of scripture says it's almost the same as if we were just putting the nails back in Jesus's hands and crucifying him again and again and again, deliberately sinning even though we know better. So it matters what we do, even though we know we're not saved by our own works, we're saved by grace through our faith in Jesus and the work of the finished work of the cross. It still matters what we do here according to Hebrews because if we go on sinning, there no longer remains a sacrifice for those sins if we're doing it deliberately. So it matters. Now, it doesn't matter what we do in our daily activity. We ask that question. Yes, it does. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all stand before a Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or the evil we have done in this earthly body. Remember, we talked about two different judgments. There's one judgment that, that's for salvation. There's another judgment that is uh, for the rewards, right? We'll stand before God and be judged according to whether or not we are uh, have received the forgiveness of our sins through Christ. Um, and that will be one judgment. But the, there's the judgment seat of, of Christ, Jesus, where we will be judged based on the works that we do in this life. And so we read the scripture that says that we are his masterpiece, created for good things that he planned for us long ago. There's not one of us that can say we don't have opportunities to do good things. Now, it's important that we clarify what kind of good things we're talking about, right? Because you could spend, and last week we discussed this a little bit. He says, Jesus is the foundation. Be careful what, you, what materials you use to build on that foundation. Make sure that you're using gold, silver, precious stones, not hay, wood, stubble. Why? Because it's going to be 
tried by fire. Um, so the works that we do will be judged by Jesus. Some of them will burn up and have nothing to show. Some of them will be as precious metals and, and stones that will last. And so there will be a reward for those things. So we got to be careful what types of things we do. Make sure that the good we do is actually the good Jesus is looking for, right? So we went through a practical list of some things that can be done, such as love God, love your neighbor, uh, children, obey your parents, husbands, love your wives, wives, respect your husbands, uh, parents, train your children up in the way of the Lord, and so on. So these are practical, good things things that we can be doing. And so I thought it might be um, good for us to go through some of those practical ways that we can do good as God's masterpiece with the good works prepared from before, uh, for, from long ago for us to step into, right? Because as you're going to see here in just a minute, as we read some more verses about what Jesus says in regards to us doing good, uh, it's important very important and so we should understand it so we're going to read matthew 25 33 but um, before we do i want to just kind of set the stage here matthew 25 33 comes right after a couple more kingdom parables that jesus gives and one of those parables is one that's famous and many of us has heard about the parables of the talents well in 20 in matthew 25 verse 14 Jesus says this, The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. So when we read this, then he goes on to say he gave one five talents, one two, one one talent, and so on. Um, but before we get into that, I, I want to stop for a second because a lot of times we read this, and I used to read this parable and think, well, what is a talent? Is a talent money? Is a talent a spiritual gift? What is a talent? Well, well I think you got to back up to that first verse. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and he delivered his goods to them. So a talent is not necessarily the good. A talent is a weight. If you look up the word talent, it literally means a weight or a measure of something good. A weight, like they used to say on like the scales, so a talent could be the weight of money, the weight of something valuable. So the talent isn't necessarily the good thing. The talent is the amount or the weight of the good thing. And so in this case, he says he gave his servants goods. Okay, so God has given each of us good things. He's deposited good things in us uh, that we would then take the measure, the weight of the good things that we have, and then he expects us to do something with that. So he says in this parable, if you were to go back and read the whole thing, which we're not going to do now because I want to kind of get into the meat of the message for today, he says that he gave one of his servants five talents, one two talents, and one one talent. And then he goes away, but then he comes back and he expects a report on what they did with those, remember, goods, the, the measure of goods that they were given. And he expects that there is a increase, a return, that they used them. So in Matthew 25, 20, he says, So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents, a measure of five measures of goods. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. And his Lord said to them, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Two things that we see there that are important that I think I want to do and you probably want to do also. One, enter his joy. So the one faithful with the talents was able to enter into the joy of the Lord. And receive more. You were faithful with five 
Here's five more. Clearly, it is important to God that when he gives us whatever goods those are, it could be money, it could be spiritual gifts, it could be um, just the, the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through us. Remember, the disciples came to the man who was lame and begging for money, and they said, money we don't have, but what we do have we give you. Get up and pick up your mat. And they healed him. The power of the Holy Spirit. So God in you, flowing out of you. You have the goods that God has given you. Now God expects for whatever measure that you've been given, you would use that, and then he wants to continue to increase that. And as you do, he says, you enter his joy as you receive more. So again, we, we ended last week talking about the things that we are kind of expected to do. The good that is the basics that we're expected to do. As I put these pieces together, I think if we do these things, not only do we receive more, but we enter his joy. Love God, love your neighbor, honor your mother and father, train your kids in the way of the Lord, etc. So let's look at these things a little bit and kind of practically break them down. Today, specific, specifically, love God, love your, your neighbor. And I think there's more to that maybe than we realize as we skate over those verses sometimes. So first of all, let's read Ephesians 2.10, which is where we kind of started, left off last week with the, the verse about masterpiece. For we are God's masterpiece, and he has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do good things that he planned for us long ago. Now, let's go to Matthew 25, 33. Remember, these are the verses right after the verse of the parable of the talents. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick and in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did this to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Father, again, thank you for your scripture, your word. Help us now to understand what good things we can do. And God, thank you that as we do them, we enter into your joy. And as we just read, inherit the kingdom. In your name we pray. Be with us in this time. Amen. All right, so some key components to these verses here, right? Uh, first of all, we're talking about entering into his joy. We're talking about receiving more talents in order, uh, or goods in order to, um, the, a larger measure of the goods in order to continue to do good. We're talking about inheritance of the kingdom of God. And what does he say? Well done what? Good and faithful when we're talking in the, in the verses that we read earlier about the um, man with five talents who invested them and got five more. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So what does God expect the, from us as we read that verse? He expects us to be good. Now, we know that the Bible says no one is good except for God. So how can we be good? Well, we were good when we enter into this relationship with Christ and we are saved by grace through faith because the blood of Jesus then cleanses us. And so it's not our goodness, it's his goodness. So then how can we be faithful? Well, we're faithful when we follow through. I mean, this is one of the keys to good works. Faithfulness. It's not your own idea of what is good. It's God's idea of what is good. And then being faithful to follow through with that. And we just read a list of things that God said are good works. I have a lot of friends who are business owners. And they say the same thing 
all of them over and over, it's getting harder and harder to find people who either want to work, but B, when they do work, are faithful. I don't know if you've ever hired somebody. I, I hired a contractor not that long ago to help me out with some stuff at the house. And he would say he'd show up and then he wouldn't. He would say he ordered things and he didn't. He would say he knew what he was doing and he didn't. And it was like, my goodness, the faithfulness level is like non-existent. And if you've ever dealt with somebody who is not faithful, who you who you believed would follow through, who you trusted... Um, because they were trustworthy, because they were believable, and then they don't follow through, and they're not faithful. It is one of the most frustrating things in the world, right? And God says, look, I expect you to be good through the sacri- through the, the faithful, or your faith in Jesus Christ, but faithful through your own actions of following through in doing what I've asked you to do. It's a key here that we need to understand that we want to and should be and must be faithful with what God has asked us to do. And the result of faithfulness is that you'll rule over more or you'll give, be given more talents. You'll enter into his joy and you'll inherit his kingdom. Remember he said in 34, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I'll bet if I did a show of hands right now of all those out there who want more, who want joy, and who want to inherit the kingdom, everyone would raise their hand. And so it's important that we understand faithfulness. Well, faithfulness to what? To the things that he has asked us to do. So here's... uh, We're not talking necessarily about salvation here. You'll be saved. But we're talking about the talents or the goods that he's given you and utilizing or using them in order to accomplish what the, the good works as his masterpiece that he set out before you. So he says, do good. Well, how can we do good? He laid it out for us right after the, the, the verses about the talents. He says in verse 35, For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat, thirsty and you gave me something to drink, stranger and you invited me in, naked and you clothed me, sick and you visited me, I was in prison and you came to me. So let's just look at those. I was hungry, he says, and you gave me something to eat. See, our minds immediately go to the person on the street corner when we hear, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. And that's not bad. You know, like, I think it's um, a good thing to help people out who are out asking for help. Um, We should help them. You know, if if you see someone holding a sign that says, hungry, family's hungry, whatever, we can help them out. That is one way to help others out. Uh, Food banks need volunteers and donations. in America, we don't understand this much because we look around and, and like it's so accessible to, to obtain a hundred varieties of potato chips. And so we don't really think like this, but there's people all over the world starving, right? And there's people even here starving. And we, we oftentimes we judge like, well, that's their own fault. And I understand that. Like we don't, if we know that someone is utilizing resources for something evil, we shouldn't enable that. However, if we, it's hard for us to to judge based on seeing someone who's in need of help and just assuming, right? And God doesn't really ask us to do that. He says, help. Um, and so there's little easy practical ways for us to help those who are hungry. Um, there's organizations that support people around the world who do vet the scenario and see what it looks like. So you can support that organization. I recently was at an event where I heard someone talking about food co-ops. Okay, And here's what he said. He said, what would happen if Amazon went down? What would happen if Walmart went down? What would happen if Instacart stopped working? What would happen if Publix shelves went bare? Not just the toilet paper like we saw a while ago, but literally you went to Publix and the distribution of food had ceased and it was, and people immediately took everything they could and all of a sudden the food distribution as we know it was um, interrupted. What would we do? And he was talking about churches setting up food call, co-ops where, and, and um, uh, like, like uh, community gardens where 20 by 20 
uh, setups could sustain a family of four. And I got really interested in this because, um, first of all, some of these larger companies and organizations and corporations and stuff uh, in some ways are fueling some problems and we're putting a little too much emphasis, weight and reliance on them. Um, second, because if, if it, what if you did have a community of people you banded together with who could support one another and provide the goods and the food and the different things like that? It wouldn't matter what happened. You'd have this kingdom of God community supporting one another. I support. I think that's a good idea. I think that there should be families connecting, having a plan, understanding what they'll do if something goes sideways. I mean, we're seeing this kind of stuff in the world today. We've, we're seeing global events. We're seeing supply chains lacking. We're seeing all this stuff. So it's good to be thinking about this now so that you can be one of those people who is supplying and helping others. They'll probably be supplying and helping you. And there's this reciprocal par- process of a, a way to care for others in times of lack and need. We're in times of plenty. We've lived in times of plenty for a long time, but it wouldn't take much for certain things to happen and a sequence of events to go down where there would be hungry people around us. And if we set ourselves up ahead of time to understand how we can provide for those hungers, that that hunger, and even our own and our kids, right? So I think we should be thinking about these things. He also says, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. What if, what if, the city water supply got messed up. What would we do? Do we have a plan? Um, there's, again, organizations around the world that provide clean drinking water to people who have a tough time getting to it. Things we take for granted. We can support those institutions. But we can also have a plan for ourselves in case something did happen near us where we might need this, right? Um, go on and, and uh, look up, I think they're like iodine uh, tabs that you can put in um, uh, 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 water that's not clean to drink and it'll clean it enough for you to be able to drink it and ways that you can filter and support yourself if something were to go uh, a little sideways with the water supply for a while, right? We should have this in mind, not just so we can sustain and help ourselves, but we can help others if something was to go wrong like that, but that we can also help people today. He said, I was a stranger and you invited me in. This one is the kind um, that we often justify why not to do it. Because I think when we hear, "You were, I was a stranger and you invited me in, we think that it is in regards to like someone sleeping at our house. A place to sleep, right? You're going to find a stranger who's in need. You're going to invite them into your home and they're going to sleep at your house with your young children sleeping in the other room. Well... <laughs> You know, honestly, there's wisdom to be used as we're making decisions in life, right? Probably not the greatest idea to bring, like, a a scary, strange man into the house when you have young girls as children sleeping in the other room. So we got to use wisdom on what we do. Uh, But maybe it is that you're going to meet someone who's in need and you feel the Lord lead you to invite them in and give them a place to stay while they get back on their feet. But maybe it's not just about a place to sleep. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Who else was a stranger and was invited in? We were. God decided one day, hey, stranger. As a matter of fact, worse than stranger, we were his enemies, the Bible says. And yet God said, I'll provide a way because I want to invite you in. Invite you into what? Invite you into his home. Invite you into a relationship. I was a stranger and you invited me in. How many strangers have we invited into relationship? Invited to a meal? Invited to church? Invited to friendship? Jesus was constantly inviting people into a friendship and a relationship with him through all of these means. So we can find ways to provide for those who are hungry, to provide for those who are thirsty, to provide for those who are strangers. These are things that Jesus modeled. These are things that he expects from us. Remember, we're talking about practical ways to love God and love others because he says here that in loving others, even the least of these, we showed our love for him. 
So ask ourselves, what can I do to help feed someone, to help provide water or something to drink for someone, or prepare for the time where that might become necessary around me? What can I do to invite someone? Um, who might I extend an invitation to for lunch or friendship or a food co-op or whatever it might be? Next thing, Jesus says, I was naked and you clothed me. This is a simple one. There's lots of, or we, as Americans, we get rid of more stuff. My goodness. We, we throw clothes out, furniture out, all kinds of things, right? Um, I was talking to someone recently and he said, it's only in America where we need storage units for our stuff that we can't fit in our house, right? So there's ways for us to give. You can give through simple means and simple ways like goodwill. Just take the extra time and effort to go ahead and sort it and take it somewhere. Um, we can just give it to friends. Um, maybe you know a person um, who's in need at the moment. I knew a person who actually started her own ministry where she would gather from all of her friends different types of food, of clothing and things like that. And as soon as they had enough stored up, they would get a shipping container and they would ship it overseas to a church that they knew would distribute it to people in need and they would they they just started doing that they made a connection with the church and they said what if i started sending you shipping containers full of good stuff would you use it and they said yeah we would distribute that out to people so there are practical ways that we can do that he said you i was sick and you visited me this one's hard going into hospitals going into uh, living centers and things like that for some of us is such an emotional thing that it's difficult for us to follow through with this one. But God does say there's things that we can do. Now, if you feel like you are so emotionally drained or it's just overwhelming to you, there's other things you can do. You can work in a kitchen, um, giving your time to provide meals to families who are in living situations with children in hospitals or what have you. So there's lots of ways that we can still um, visit and, and, and provide and help for those who are sick and having a tough time. Places we can volunteer. And then the last one he says is, I was in prison and you came to me. Well, have you ever thought about that? Why prison ministry? Why visit people in prison? Perhaps this is a reference to like Paul who was thrown in prison because he was preaching the gospel. And so he was thrown in prison for doing good things for the kingdom of God. But it, Jesus doesn't make a distinction here of I was in prison because I was preaching the gospel and you came to me. He just says I was in prison and you came to me. So why prison ministry? I mean, I looked up some of the prison ministries that are around and, and a lot of them mention some different things about why prison ministry is important. Let me give you a feel. Currently, according to this one uh, source that I was looking into, there's 2.1 million incarcerated in the United States. 2.1 million in the U.S. 1.5 million children are without parents because their parents are in prison. 600,000 people are released back into society each year from prison, two-thirds of which are re-arrested within three years. There's broken relationships because of this, victimization, instability, impacting families and communities. And these folks, um, what if these folks received the love, the hope, and the purpose that Jesus offers, could those numbers change? Romans 10, 14 says, How can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? How can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? How can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. And so with the folks that are in prison, they need the good news just as much as anyone else needs the good news. And so how much of the hope and love and purpose of Jesus could change some of those stats that we just talked about? Jesus says, I was in prison and you came to me. So Jesus gives us some practical things here. The kinds of things that are related to our faith in Jesus, him being the head, us being the body, and therefore going where the head goes and the result of our faith in good works. These are the kinds of things that produce an inheritance. These are the kinds of things that produce us entering into his joy and 
receiving more goods or talents in order to continue to be going out and doing good. When you did it even to the least of them, he said, we'll kind of wrap this message for today up, loving God and loving others. He says, then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we do, uh, see you hungry and feed you, thirsty, give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick and in prison? The king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, the extent that you did this to the to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. So as we go, even to the least of them, doing these good deeds, we do it to him. We love others. We love God. We love God by loving others. And this is just one thing that he talks to us about in terms of us as a masterpiece, a new creation created for good works that he prepared for us beforehand. We don't have to sit and pray, God, give me some direction on things I can do as good works. These will always be here. These are things that will always be that we can step into. And so find some ways to practically do good around you. I know I'm convicted by some of these things because there's some that I'm just not actively involved in. And I want to, I mean, I, 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 it's challenging. But Jesus said, as his body, we're to do those works. And so I want to uh, encourage you, encourage myself to look for opportunities to do some of these things. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you that you have been kind to us, that you have helped us in our time of need, that you've clothed us, fed us given us something to drink, that you've um, helped us when we were uh, sick, that you've helped us when we were in prison, either naturally or even just bound by the devil. Uh, Lord, you've set us free. And God, I thank you for the ministry um, that we've received. And Lord, now we in turn reproduce that in our society and around us that we would do good works lord the ones that we were created to do as your masterpiece thank you that you provide for us your joy that we enter into an inheritance of your kingdom and god as we are faithful to do with what you've given us the goods you've given us um, lord help us to increase in the good we can do and may we just experience your joy over and over as we do it. We love you. We thank you. Help us now to follow through and to do the good works you've called us to do. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. And we'll see you back here.